Yes. <laughs> alamogordolive.net, and we're going to be live streaming it. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. No, no, the push. Just a moment. Just one moment. Thank you. Okay, are you ready? Um, yes, let me go ahead and unmute now. Sure. <laughs> are you all ready in the back with the audio? Yeah. Ken, okay? Ken Bass, in the back. Ken Bass? Is this the gentleman back here from the radio station? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I said, I don't think they remember. Um, yes, actually, that one part that's something I need to talk about. And we also recorded on the live stream as well. Yeah, I do. Anyway, um, the camera went black. Yes, they do. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah. Test your mic. One, two. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. We're ready. Okay. Well, good morning to everyone. Good morning to everyone in our remote locations. Thank you for joining us. And if you're watching on alamogordolive.net this morning, we appreciate you tuning in to see this event for the next 90 minutes. For those of you here at the IMAX Theater, welcome to this facility at the New Mexico Museum of Space History. We're going to get underway. Let me first introduce uh, the mayor of Alamogordo, Susie Galea. Grateful Mike will be our traffic cop uh, here today. He will uh, help us go from one location to another. Um, I want to welcome everyone to our first virtual women's conference in Alamogordo. And I am grateful for the hard work that the New Mexico Museum of Space History has uh, put forth to facilitate uh, this. And our, this may be, very well be our very first uh, Southern New Mexico women's uh, conference. So I'm excited to be breaking ground with you, uh, many women today. I am grateful for the technical support of our woman-owned business uh, by Leona St. Louis from AlamogordoLive.net and uh, to together. <laughs> and I especially uh, want to thank those joining us from Hobbs, Carlsbad, Roswell, Socorro, Berlin, Silver City, Las Cruces, and on the internet. We have gathered here together to create uh, solutions in our communities and to empower women everywhere to improve our economy. The nation has been led by women's groups, and uh, I believe we will be led okay. in our economy by women's groups that gather together and uh, create solutions. And we're going to solve the okay. problems okay. affecting our checkbooks and our business expansions. Uh, a few years ago, I owned and managed a small child care business, um, but it was not able to be expanded. Uh, the government uh, tax regulations um, were choking, and so uh, I was not successful in expanding my business. And I do believe that government is not the answer. Um, how many of you live on a budget? Great to see a show of hands. Um, how many of you balance your checkbook? And uh, I think it's time that we demand that our federal government do the same, that they yes. also be fiscally responsible, right. and that uh, they live on a budget and balance their checkbook. Um, Congressman Pierce is leading the charge to all of us in our nation that we become a self-reliant people. And this is the first virtual meeting ever with Congressman Pierce. And it's appropriate that it's here in Alamogordo as this is the uh, birthplace of space exploration. So we're excited uh, to be breaking ground on this day. And on behalf of women everywhere, uh, especially here, I want to express gratitude, gratitude to Congressman Pierce for inspiring us to gather together today. And I find it admirable that he also has a vision for a virtual Congress. And uh, we see how effective this is to bring us together and uh, I think today will accomplish much good. Uh, I'm excited to introduce our Congressman Pierce. Uh, he promotes, when women work, we win. I would like to hear a warm welcome for our Congressman Pierce. Okay, thank you. Just, uh, good, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. We appreciate you being here. Uh, first of all, before we get started, thanks to our remote locations for checking in. Also uh, to Alamogordo, the city, uh, thanks for this magnificent uh, institution. We've got Chris Orwell, we, we need to thank, and then Michael Shinnaberry was out when we first started. Uh, Kathy Harper, 
uh, is uh, somewhere in the building here, and finally, uh, Leona St. Louis, that uh, the very capable uh, on the road of life uh, technician. So we, uh, my wife's favorite saying is that uh, the hand that rocks the cradle steadies the nation. We're in desperate need of that hand steadying this nation right now. We've divided ourselves almost every single way that we can. It's time not to divide ourselves, but to put ourselves together. Since the women, frankly, and the families are the nurturers, they're the ones that keep things pulled together, I thought uh, that I would listen to my wife's uh, platitude there, their, their favorite saying, and that uh, women, when women work, we win. Uh, five W's, that's the, the words that we use in our office, and so we're saying, why don't we expand that? Let's involve women. They make 85% of the decisions on health care. They make most of the decisions on education for the family. They make most of the decisions uh, on spending the money of the family. Somebody said 85%. If that's the case, then our family actually averages that number quite a, uh, quite a ways up because my wife does almost all of the spending for our family. But if women will focus on the issues of the day, then I think that we as a nation are going to start solving the problems. Now, one of the things I hear most frequently is that Washington doesn't talk together, that we're not working across party lines. Frankly, we as Americans don't talk together. Everywhere I go, I ask Democrats, I ask Republicans, when's the last time you sat down with someone in the other party and began to talk? Almost never do we do that. So these, these discussions have been set up for, uh, for exactly that. We're hoping that, uh, that the discussions involve Democrats, Republicans, independents, people who don't even involve themselves in politics. We hope they cross racial lines, cultural lines, faith lines, because that's the way that we're going to fix ourselves as a nation. Not by concentrating on the things that divide us, but instead the things we agree on. Usually the agreement is, is quite broad. Recently I was... Uh, I am in the Financial Services Committee in, in Washington, and I uh, served there with Michael Coquano. He's from Massachusetts. Uh, he says, I'm the most liberal member of Congress. I'm not the most conservative, but I'm far enough out on that side where he could say I'm in the, in the range. And so I went to him one day. We dusted up frequently in, in committee, and finally I walked to him, and during a committee meeting, I said, Mike, I don't know why we're doing this. I said, I like you. You, you don't work off talking points. I don't work off talking points. We, we discuss. Why don't we get together off campus and discuss? And he said, that'd be a great idea. So we actually went to dinner, and I said, what would you work on if we could work on something? You and me, far apart on the political spectrum. He's a taxes. He's a tax lawyer. Uh, he grew up like I did, just dirt poor and uh, brash. He's, he's, uh, you, you just don't survive in those kind of elements if you don't. And so, so we began uh, the discussion, and uh, we found great common ground. He said, well, that's fine. I appreciate that you do, but your corporate buddies wouldn't. And I said, I don't know, try me. I said, I'll tell you what. I think they will, and I don't even have to go ask. I will commit to a, another dinner, uh, and, and I will bring executives from any industry you choose. How is that? He said, oh, that'd be great. And uh, I said, which one? He said, oil and gas. I hate them. Okay, good. I'll get them, and uh, we get together. So we, about three weeks later, we got uh, three executives together. And he starts off saying, I do not think y'all should get tax breaks for those million dollar skyboxes. And they said, we agree with that. And as a tax lawyer, he went right down the list and they, they have great common ground. And uh, they said, well, what do you believe on our side? He said, I would lower your rates. He said, President Obama has said in his last two states of the union message that we as America charge our corporations too much. We're not competitive worldwide. And uh, they said, we definitely agree with that. And so they found very common ground. Uh, and at the end, he said, you know, you guys, I said I hated you, but I really don't. He said, you all are doing a good business and a service for the country. He said, we all get to talking kind of loosely. And uh, so we then committed that when we go back in November and December, sometime in that period, we're going to bring those same three companies back, but 10 more industries, and then the U.S. Chamber. And we're going to sit and have this kind of casual conversation that I'm hoping to have today. Finally, Susie is, is my example. Susie is, uh, first of all, I would say that Washington is not on the way to help us. If you are looking at the problems in your life, whether it be education, the budget, no matter what your problem is, I will tell you, if you're sitting in New Mexico, the chances of the federal budget or the federal government coming in to help you are slim. Why don't we start looking at solving the problems from the bottom up? 
Several years ago, I began to think of the virtue of Congress. I think we should be serving from home. I think we should be doing our, our congressional affairs in screens just like this. I think we should be sitting here. We can vote electronically. We can do this electronically. Corporations do it everywhere. And if we involve the people in the country in the processes of the government again, then I think that we're going to start solving the problems. Uh, and, and so I draw uh, real strength from Susie. She came in here, was fairly new to the community, fairly new to politics, just got elected to, to the city council, uh, was probably the newest person in town on the city council. Uh, there were differences, and suddenly she found herself as mayor. She steps into the thing and uh, doesn't let any of that scare her away. She, uh, she gets out and she gets among the people. And so we, with all of our rough edges, began to try to work through the, the, to solve the problems of the country. So this is our, uh, maybe our first attempt at the virtual Congress, but we thought it would be fitting that we began to get the women of New Mexico talking. If we get the women of New Mexico talking, the next one we would want to go broader, uh, let women everywhere start to talk. And just maybe, just maybe, we as Americans will start looking to the things that we love together, this nation, its great prosperity, the great lifestyles, the uh, safe streets, those things that we all agree on. Uh, now, my only rule here is that this is not to be a political event. If you start saying something about one party or the other, uh, I'll probably just ask that we, 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 we move on to the next person. We're here to bring up questions. Yes, there are problems. But if it starts getting on an overt political ground, you all help me and say, look, uh, we, we, we know those things that, that, again, separate us. Let's move to the things. We've had three or four of these discussions with small groups, and, and again, they've been fascinating. They've moved right directly into to the things that I felt like that would happen. And so now that we're trying it on a broader scale, we've got all those remote locations. So again, thank you all for, for checking in and, and being part of your groups today. I'm just going to open the floor to you all, and uh, let's, let's get your comments, and then I'll more direct. I would not like this to be a question and answer session to me. We'll do that later. I love Q&A. This day, though, we're talking about the things across the aisle, across, across parties among you all. Where would you go to solve the problems of the country? And then I can give insights from Washington if that's helpful. So, Michael, why don't you go ahead and activate your, uh, your microphone there, and let's go straight to Q&A and or, or straight to our comments. So do we have any attendees here in Animal Gordo that has a comment or would like to uh, be involved in the discussion to start off with? Over here? Okay. Yep. Just to give this to you. Have her come down. So Why don't you go on down? We'll kind of figure our way along here. Don't, it's not going to be uh, too smooth, maybe. Uh, be sure and watch the steps over here. It is dark, and so I almost uh, fell earlier this morning. Why don't you step down on this? Tell us who you are, and uh, thanks for being here today. I'm Denise Lang. I'm a small businesswoman here in right. um, Ochero County. And I wonder if you are aware of the impact on women's entire lives, including our economic professional lives, if we don't have the confidence and the security of knowing we have reproductive choice. I've heard you before say you don't trust the decision made by 40 million women here in the United States who have had legal safe abortions and that you don't want to continue to trust women to make those choices for themselves. And I'm not sure if you are aware of the impact I'm a mother and a grandmother, and I am horrified that there are some people who want to take that choice away from us women. Thank you. I would appreciate your comment. We'll go to the next one. Again, we're trying to talk about the things not that separate us, but the things that bring us together. Would uh, welcome the next person to talk. Anybody else here in Alamo Gordo? Just put your hand up, and we'll... Okay. All right. Well, then let's go up to uh, some of our remote locations. Uh, let's go to Carlsbad first. Carlsbad, is there anyone there who would like to make a comment or uh, has a question here for the congressman? Anybody involved in business over there? No? Okay. How about Roswell? Let's go to Roswell. We see a pretty good crowd over there in Roswell. Call on Gloria. Gloria over in Roswell. You are facilitating over there. Do you have someone who uh, would like to speak with the congressman? Hello. 
Do we have the Roswell microphone up? Mm -hmm. Here we go. Okay. Someone raised their hand. All right. Let me get them. In Roswell? No. NMJC. Ah, all right. Okay, let's go to NMJC. I see a hand up there. We've questions from you called that, so I guess they didn't call. Is that a mic? Is it We're live now. They can hear us. They can hear us. They can hear us. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Can you hear us here now? We do hear you. Yes. Okay. We have a question and a comment. Okay. Uh, my name is Mary Lyle. I'm from Hawks, Mexico. I have four sons, and they're all grown now. Uh, the youngest one is 21. I do have a son with chronic uh, health condition. He has epilepsy. And unless he gets a job that um, with health insurance, he's, he's very afraid that he won't be able to afford his medication. And uh, right now he's on his parent insurance. But there has to be a solution or a safety net. He cannot live without his medication. And so that is a big concern. Uh, also, the opportunities for good paying jobs, full-time jobs, is my other concern. My oldest son was just laid off from a job in, in uh, California, and it took him about four months to land that job. So the economic impact for our young people is what I'm really concerned with. Uh, how are we going to be able to provide the kind of security that they need? Uh, they're not wanting the you know, grand raise money. Yes, they do want to work and take care of themselves, but all they can find is part-time work. And so that isn't going to solve the, the medication problem for my one son. Thanks. Okay, we, uh, I can address those. Uh, again, what I would encourage are, are for us to be thinking about the things that we can do. And uh, so as, um, if I could get Judy Lamb or someone in Carlsbad as soon as I respond here to think about it, uh, my feeling is that, well, you all will watch. We've had seven job fairs here in the second district of New Mexico. Uh, we're having our eighth next week in Hobbs. And in every job fair, we've had this job fair in Alamo Gordo, we had 3,000 jobs available that day. That day. And I suspect that we did not fill 10 of those jobs the entire day. We had one young man, we, had, we concentrated on veterans uh, at this job fair. We had one young man drive down from Fort Collins, Colorado, the same sort of a thing. He couldn't find a job there. But until we fill the jobs across the country, uh, and, and we just don't have any more, I think that, that people are going to have to be willing and able to move or commute somewhere else. Uh, right now, you have people flying into Hobbs, New Mexico. They're flying into Roswell. They're flying into Carlsbad. They'll come in and they'll work for two weeks a month in those, those towns. They'll drive a truck or they'll work in the oil field, and frankly, they're making $80,000 a year working two weeks a month. Two weeks a month, they're commuting in. They're filling our hotel rooms up every day. Uh, the last time we as an office tried to get a hotel room in house, we paid over $200 a night because the, the rooms were just constantly booked by these people. When they go home for two weeks, they know it's hard to get a, a room in house. So they just keep it for the two weeks they're gone. And so we have a very strong occupancy and it's driving those rates up. Uh, but w while we have the job shortages in California, that's for whatever reasons, and we could go into that discussion at some other point, but uh, I think that we need to be looking at the jobs all across the country. Everywhere that uh, I know in this job fair that's coming up in Hobbs uh, next week that we're going to have companies represent who will say, we'll give you a job today. My son-in-law moved to Hobbs about oh, a year ago, walked in, first job, hired, no experience, nothing, and, and it was a good high paying job. So, so I, I think that at some point we need to, uh, just people to start looking at other parts of the country where the jobs are available. I know that in North Dakota, that the representative from there said that if you go to work in McDonald's in North Dakota, you make $17 an hour and they give you a $500 signing bonus. And so, uh, so right now, while we've got struggles in some states, we need to look to, to the areas at which, uh, at, at which we are working. And then we need, as a nation, we need to open up those job opportunities uh, and, and make sure that we have not just jobs, but careers. 
things where you could prog progress up, things where you could could grow in the jobs. Uh, right now, the great problem with our economy is that we're 70% retail. Uh, you can't make the kind of living in retail that you can in an industry where you can, can uh, be in different processes and, and get promotions. So I think that we as a nation need to be looking at bringing back the, the manufacturing that we've lost so that we're not so dependent on retail sales. The great weakness of our economy is that retail. The weakness of the dollar begins because we as Americans don't save. But when we save, we quit spending and then, the do and then our, our, uh, our economy gets weak. So we're in a seesaw with either a strong dollar or a weak economy or a weak dollar and a strong economy and if we brought that manufacturing back we could have a strong dollar and a strong economy and so uh, that's the answer. The first part, uh, absolutely, there's a discussion nationwide going to where we can find solutions for those people that do not have health coverage. Uh, don't disagree with that at all. Uh, I think that's probably not something we're going to solve today. Let's go to uh, more questions here, more observations, actually. Uh, it looks like Leon has got... Um, Roswell has a question. Roswell, okay. Roswell. Who had the question in Roswell? Gloria? Okay, we can hear you from Roswell. The uh, small business owners from uh, Carlsbad, why don't you all come in? Uh, Y'all had the, the very fascinating discussion about the problems that you had filling your jobs. Uh, the small business owners there were were indicating things that I hear frequently. But uh, somebody from uh, from Carlsbad, why don't you all give us kind of a recap of what uh, what things came up in, in y'all's discussion that day? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So first of all, I want to say good morning to everyone. I want to thank you especially for encouraging groups of women like us to take an active role in paying attention to economic issues that directly affect our families, communities, and society. Um, and I want to thank you uh, again for, for uh, your interest in, in wanting to hear our, the unique perspectives that women bring to the table. Um, I also want to thank, first of all, uh, the individuals who helped coordinate this technical state of communication so we can visit around the state with other groups of women. Um, this is actually our second forum, forum held in Carlsbad. We held one in Carlsbad about three months uh, ago, back in June, and we were in attendance. And uh, if I may, just, just uh, categorically, I went through some notes and, and used my memory to, to summarize those issues that we talked about. Maybe that can, that can prompt some, some discussion. Uh, the first one I think has already been touched on. And the first, the first discussion or topic that we talked about was the rising cost of health care. Uh, we discussed how that rising cost of health care has made it almost impossible for individuals and families to buy individual policies. But as the, as the first, uh, as, as your first, uh, the your first individual who spoke mentioned, it's particularly difficult for, for individuals in business uh, to offer uh, health care for as, they, uh, as part of their benefit packages for their employees. A second area of, uh, of economic impact that we talked about was the entitlement programs um, and how they impact the economy, in particular the welfare program. Uh, we discussed not only the economic burden of these programs, but also we discussed the, uh, how, how fraud and abuse has exacerbated these problems. Um, the third issue we talked about was the impact of rising cost of living, on, particularly on individuals with fixed income. And the fourth area that we talked on, the fourth topic we talked about was, um, and I'm just summarizing these together, were the issues of jobs, employment, unemployment, and underemployment. Um, in Carlsbad, we, we don't have a, we actually have a very different situation than most places around the country. Um, we have very low unemployment, and a good part of that is because we have the oil field, um, oil and gas in our area. So these are issues that don't it don't affect us in particular. Uh, I want to say, uh, let, let me clarify that. We do have issues of employment in particular sectors. 
such as healthcare. Um, but overall, we we don't. One of the one of the other areas uh, issues that we brought up was the issue of education um, and how that impacts our ability to fill positions that are open at this point and future positions. Okay. Hope that helps. Yeah, you. yeah, it does. I appreciate it. The uh, first of all, the idea of education. So, I mean, we've seen for decades that that we have not been able to to uh, improve on our dropout rates. Uh, I'm hearing from our businesses that kids maybe aren't as hireable as they used to be. Uh, if you take a look at New Mexico recently, we had Intel begin to move out of the state, and uh, their comment was that uh, that we're just not getting the graduates that we need to, and I think they scoot over to Arizona whatever uh, but so uh, we did uh, in a couple of our meetings previous we've had discussions about what can we do not what can Washington do because Washington again in my belief is not on the way to solve your problem uh, for whatever reasons Washington doesn't seem to be responding the the, uh, the changes they put in don't seem to be effective and uh, so what can we do as communities Again, in the self-reliance uh, end of things, uh, I just look more to, to how we can start and kickstart our, ourselves locally. For instance, yesterday uh, we've had a local radio station in Las Cruces just having coats for kids. You know, it's a, it's a, that's a, a small step, but it's us saying that we can solve the problems among us. Yes, we've got problems with kids that, that don't have enough to eat. We have problems with kids that don't uh, have enough uh, clothes for the, the winter time. And what can we do, not what can Washington do or what can Santa Fe do. Another one of the examples in New Mexico of our self-reliance is the Isleta Pueblo up south of Albuquerque, just right in the southern edge. And uh, so constantly they're coming and asking for more funding for housing that the, the, the people in their, their tribes just don't have housing. Uh, so I began to say, look, we, we're paying two and sometimes three hundred dollars a foot to build houses on reservations why don't you do something internally? I mean, we, we give you money, but it's never going to be enough to build the number of houses you, you need. And so one guy went out and they had crushed lava back 25 years ago in order to put, they, they were selling it, put on lawns as decorative material. And we in New Mexico think crushed lava is a good decorative decoration, but we didn't keep their business afloat. So it went, it went bust and the equipment sat out there for decades. So one guy with a grease gun went out there and he started greasing that equipment, got it to where it would work. And then uh, he went to a, an auction for the tribe. The, the big guy was uh, selling the equipment there. And uh, they uh, bought a half million dollar piece of equipment for two or three thousand dollars that mixed concrete to, uh, on a computer. And they began to make two blocks at a time on cookie sheets. They were uh, putting the lava rock in it so the, the, uh, the blocks are R50 for insulation. And uh, so they make two blocks at a time so they have a thousand of these cookie sheets. And so here's this small tribe of Indians making 2,000 blocks a day. They use two guys to make 2,000 blocks a day. 2,000 blocks will build one house. And so they use other tribal members to stack the stuff up. They're built in E shape like this, and then they come in and just pour the concrete. They don't, they don't route them in or anything. They stack them up, pour concrete in the E's. They have conduit, and they're building houses that are R50, brand new houses for $63 a foot that they are doing themselves. And so they built a whole the little, uh, you know, the, the, the little uh, circle there of 20 houses, and that they, they filled them up just like that. So they scooted over, did another 20 houses, and they project that they'll be completely filled. Every house that they need is going to be built within the next two years. And that's the sort of thing, if they sit and say, what are you going to do in Washington? It's never going to get solved. Mm -hmm. But if they say, okay, how can we use the resources that we have available? We get a grease gun, we go out, and we just start thinking our way through it. Uh, those are the, the ideas that we're trying to say. So Judy is talking about the full employment in Carlsbad. I'm thinking, and I've been suggesting, I would like for you as, as uh, wives and moms to tell me what you think, but I've been suggesting to the people in, in uh, uh, Anthony where they have very low, uh, very low employment opportunities, I'm saying, would you, would you all run a bus over to the east side you carry your uh, workers over there, take 15 or 20 people from the community, you work two weeks, bring them back with another shift to replace them. I mean, people are commuting from uh, Louisiana and Alabama, Gordo, I mean, from Alabama, working two weeks and then going back home. 
is that something? And so uh, anybody got ideas about that? Uh, for the people who are not employed here, I know we have 3,000 jobs, but maybe they're not $80,000 a year jobs. You got entry level jobs over there in, in that side of the state that are paying that. What would you think about your spouse commuting for two weeks and then coming back? Uh, anybody have observations on that? Do you have a comment? Yep, uh, some over here, yes. That's kind of a problem for the families, though. What do you do with your children when the dad is gone for two weeks out of the month? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's the same question that we've got when we, uh, when we send them, we deploy them. This area deploys people into the military zones. Uh, I used to live, I was served in the Air Force, was in the Mississippi Valley, and, uh, and traditionally those farm families would go, they would send the husband up to St. Louis, Chicago, in the winter time, they would they would go up and just live for six months, come back home. All I'm saying is that yes, it's a problem, but what is what? Yes, we've got observations here. Susie, why don't you go ahead and uh, kind of run the discussion there? You've got a point, and then let's recognize. Uh, real quickly, um, I'm a military spouse. When my husband leaves uh, for two weeks, four months, uh, I know it's because he's providing for our family. He's putting food on our table and also doing his duty to our country. And um, I think what the what an answer and a solution would be is uh, when you're traveling two weeks to another city, if it be another state away, it's uh, short-term uh, housing. And we have that problem here in Alamogordo. Uh, there's going to be uh, potentially a biomass that's built, and there's going to need to be uh, housing for 300 contactors for a six-month period. Finding short-term housing for 300 people, that's our problem here. And I think that might be the problem in many other places when you travel for a job for two weeks or three months it's finding short-term housing mm -hmm. and I'd like to uh, move over to Nancy. I think the key thing in a situation like that you know our communities need to pull together obviously having a job for two weeks at a time is better than having no job at all and not being able to stay in your home and being displaced but it is critical and one thing we do a very good job at in El Gordo uh, many of us are taking care of our families um, through the health council uh, through, through many of the Lovey, Zia, uh, ch children in need of services, but we have to think in terms of economic development that it is critical to support your nonprofits and your organizations supporting families. And right now, as the, we will all attest to, because of the dollar situation and the crunch, it's getting more and more difficult. We are under the same regulations as any other for-profit company, and we have to do it for far less dollars. Another thing, we do the child care. Obviously, in a situation like that. Um, child care is going to be critical. We have three centers. If that minimum wage increases, I honestly don't know how we'll make it. We had five centers go out of town in our uh, town already. Um, you know, when minimum wage increase will put us out of child care out of business, particularly in a town like Alamogordo where the poverty rate is so low and we do rely heavily upon that subsidy. Okay, good point. Okay. Mike, when we talk, you got to go down below. The poverty rate is high. So they can hear us. Yeah. So All right. Not, yeah, you said like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 I'm
So I challenge you, we've got a lot of dollars going up there. I don't mind paying my fair share as long as I know is my fair share is coming back to benefit me, my family, and my community. And I've lived in Alamogordo, and we, what we lack in resources, we overachieve in our people power. And I believe that we have the solutions in our community if we can have the resources, and if we can control what we send up to you, bring it back to us, and I can tell you, we can get back to the America that I want to see, and the America that I remember as a child. All right. Well stated. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, let me make a quick comment on that. And then, uh, Congressman, uh, we have some folks in Hobbs who are waiting okay, for now, now that we've got uh, the fire going, but the, the yellow tablet idea, I went to the state legislature last year, and you've seen my presentation here. People want to make the budget all complex, and I think it needs to be all simplified on the yellow tablet idea. So if you can imagine my yellow tablet here today, which uh, we'll have next time, but uh, our, our budget. We spend 3.6. Forget all of those zeros because they simply confuse you. If you're off by one zero, it's a, it's a billion or trillion or million or something. It's a big number. 3.6 is what we spend. We bring in 2.3. Now, do the math for us, guys. Uh, it's minus 1.3 is the difference there. Minus 1.3 is the deficit. And then people in Washington don't all understand the relationship between the deficit and the debt. The deficit is what we're short this year. But when we spend that money, it actually becomes part of the debt. So our, our budget, the shortfall is our deficit. But then I always show this little kind of uncomplex barrel. So I've just got a pipeline because I'm a oil field guy. you got your pipeline running from the deficit over here, and it runs into the barrel. We as a nation now have debt that's somewhere over $16 trillion, 16 t So our economy is barely 15 t and so now our debt is bigger than the economy, which is frightening economists. And so we're looking at financial instability, and it's exactly like uh, the woman said. Now, then, one more thing you said is that we can look at this stuff. Uh, and by the way, I share your opinion. I was last year uh, recognized as one of the 11 hardest votes for Mr. Boehner. My, he's my, my side, and he's my speaker. The 11 hardest votes for him to get. And it was exactly on this issue. We're doing nothing. We're doing nothing in Washington to balance our bank, our books. And, and I'm not going to be an easy vote until we start. We don't have to move all the way in one step, but certainly we can do more than this, which is what we have been doing. Both parties are complicit in this. Don't, don't get me to thinking that this is a, a deal. Uh, then I think the, uh, the last point uh, that I would make with respect to that is that you all remember the night the government was going to shut down? You remember that? We were supposed to be biting our fingernails. Well, at 11 o'clock, we were all in the, in, in the Capitol. Uh, each party was gathered in uh, so survey's own, you know, we wringing their hands. And, and I, I stood up at 1130, and I said, you know, I don't want the government to shut down either. But why don't we, if we shut down, let's get Democrats, Republicans. We have about 13 appropriation bills. Let's get, we divide ourselves into 13 teams, and we begin a 24-hour look. We, we start looking at every line and those appropriation bills, and we allow America to vote. We reboot. We kick everything offline. Now, it would not be kicking off today, but uh, we would say, okay, we're going to kick it offline, and six months from now or three months from now, everything that the American people have not rebooted doesn't get rebooted. And we would say it would take, say, uh, 30 million total votes and, say, 75% uh, or 50%, whatever people would agree to to actually reboot because we have programs that we do not need. We want them, but we're borrowing money. We're printing money right now in order to make them work. You know that quantitative easing, you hear that word a lot. That's uh, Washington speak for print money. So we're quantitative easing now for the third year. So we're putting our entire economy at risk, and, and your points are very well made. Uh, sorry, I've gotten much more into this than I want to get. We're going to get these other speakers coming in. Okay, okay let's go to Hobbs. The folks over in Hobbs have a question. Why don't we bring them up? Speakers That's what I just told you. Yeah. So pull them down. We have a question here. We do have a question. 
We have a question uh, from Erica in Las Cruces. They had some trouble signing on, so they uh, texted a question. Okay. Congressman Pierce, thank you for your support of agriculture. Agriculture is a woman's issue since many farms and ranches are now owned by women, and of course, all women eat. Food prices have risen lately due to the high cost of energy for running the tractors in the field, the tractor trailers that haul the food to the grocery store. What can we do to bring the price of gas down? Well, frankly, the two things, uh, we need more refineries. We have not allowed a refinery to be built in 30 years in the country. There are environmental concerns and we should address them, but we must start moving ahead. Right now, the drilling that's going on in southeast New Mexico that's creating these $80,000 a year jobs are filling up the pipelines at our refineries. We just had a, a, had a meeting earlier this week and the pipelines are literally filled up. We don't have enough capacity. So the people who said we can't get energy independent are not as correct as those who say that we can solve our problems uh, here in the U.S. What has changed? Why were we saying five years ago we could not be energy independent and today we can? And keep in mind that the oil discovered in the last six years in the southeast part of New Mexico is more, I'm, I'm sorry, that's not correct, it's one find, one discovery in southeast New Mexico, south of Carlsbad, almost to Malaga, is more oil than we have created the entire 90 years we've been making oil in, in New Mexico. What's the difference? We used to drill straight down and it was like a jackpot. You either hit the producing zone or you didn't. Now then we've developed and so you know these ge geological uh, maps and that shows all the different formations of rock and things. So usually the formations that, that produce oil are, are very narrow, maybe a foot and a half deep disc. So you drill through it and you can only produce a zone around a well like this. Now then we can turn horizontal and so you can visualize this whole geological layout and we can drill two miles out this way and that's now like a complete oil well that used to be producing in this big zone is two miles now producing. And so we're used to our wells in that, that end of the state. 20 barrels a day was, was a pretty good well. Now then we're hitting 1,000, 2,000 barrel a day wells. And it's because of this new technology. So absolutely the price of gasoline is a matter of supply and demand. Um, we, we just need more refining capacity. We have the oil. Uh, if we would just keep our oil here, uh, we wouldn't have to buy from the countries that hate us. We could become more self-sufficient. We could create these $80,000 a year jobs, and we could get the price of gasoline down. So that's that's sort of the take on that. Come on in. Okay, we have Linda here who runs a franchise business in Alberta. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Hey, thanks. Nice to see you. I'd like to go back to the the uh, personal finances that that Sharon was talking about. Um, and I want to address it at the highest level because I really feel like the people that I deal with every day with their personal finances are absolutely frightened to death about the quantitative easing. Yes. They are scared that we're printing fiat money. Some of us do our homework in history and we understand what happens to countries that print fiat money for very long. I call it terrorism at the highest level because my people in this community that I deal with are scared to death about what may happen in the near future because of this. So I wanna just take that um, to, to the very top and talk about um, congressional pension plans, congressional health care, and congressional insider trading and how you address that or will address that for us in Congress. Yeah. Uh, the first thing is that I think that we should, in Congress, we do not, we shouldn't be some sort of elite, we should live with what the rest of America lives with. I think that our, in fact, uh, we actually have Blue Cross, Blue Shield, that's our, our health care, uh, and so many of the things that you're addressing have, have been weeded out over the past two decades. The, the, the congressional pension plans, people have the belief that if I work one year, well, I suddenly have a golden retirement. The truth is, after working six years and buying my six years of Air Force time, uh, we had enough to pay the insurance premiums. And, and now that I'm back in, it's being deducted out of, out of my active duty pay or whatever. So it's, it's, so many of the abuses have been corrected. But I do think, and, and we do pay on the Social Security. Uh, but the broader question that you asked, how many people are, are really concerned about the printing of money? I know I am, so, so how many people would be concerned? I generally find that sort of, of response 
Argentina a hundred years ago was was an economy that was just rattling the U.S. to be the best economy in, in, in the Americas. Argentina elected to start living with deficits and printing money. So two years ago, Argentina's inflation rate was 1,500 percent. Do you know what 1,500 percent does to your dollars in the bank? If you begin the year with $150,000, 1,500% inflation says at the end of the year you have $10,000. It is devastating to our seniors when we start solving our economic problems by printing money. Uh, you can look at Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe was one of the best economies in Africa five, six, seven years ago. They had a change in leadership. They came in and they started printing money. And so that stable economy now is one of the most unstable, and they were printing trillion dollar notes. In other words, uh, the printing of money can never solve the problems. The reason our printing of money is not causing devastating uh, inflation right now is that the wor we're the world's reserve currency. We're able to export our printed money to 189 different countries. They, we are the common denominator. So last year you began to hear conversations from China and Russia saying that, that the U.S. should not be the reserve currency. I will guarantee you that the day that we are removed as the world's reserve currency is the day that inflation will, will be jammed back inside us because we'll not be able to, to send our inflated dollars to 189 countries. And so those things are storm clouds on the horizon that we should all be, the, our hearts should be beating a little faster when we hear that we're going to print forty billion dollars a month on top of twenty five more that we we're printing. Last year we printed seventy percent of, of of our deficit. This year we printed sixty percent and and you can see you know, just go back and check what Ben Bernanke said a couple of months ago and, and look what we're printing this year. And and uh, so I share that concern. It's one of the things that that, that causes me to make the votes and the decisions that I do. Uh, next, yeah. We had a question texted in from Socorro. Socorro's a fairly Did small. we figure out Hobbs? They were, Did we get Hobbs, y'all were great. Yes. I think you were speaking too three. far from the microphone. Yeah, you I have. Yeah, let's, let's okay. see if we can get Roswell has a comment first real okay. quick. So um, okay. if you want to go ahead, Roswell, to them, they have a question, and then I'll... Bring up Hobbs. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good morning. Yes, yeah, much better. We have a young lady here who is training at the Roswell Job Course Center. Roswell is one of two sites in New Mexico that has a job course center, and I'd like her to uh, introduce her now. She would like to introduce herself. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, Congressman Pierce. My name is Alana Estrada. I'm a female officer in protective services with job course. I was able to obtain a high school diploma and gain a career in law enforcement. Our training mostly includes tactics that can help us with jobs, such as in the military, police, firefighter. The academics that job groups offers can help young adults such as, such as myself take a step into education to get a higher paying job and a career that offers better benefits. Thank you for listening to my comments. All right, thanks. Uh, the, the comments that we have here are, are ones that I hear constantly. Young people are not sure where they're going and they feel ill-equipped with the education system, so we have to have these, these other education systems that bring us online. And so, the, I, I can't remember, it's AmeriCorps, or Job Corps, or whatever, in Roswell. They're one of the areas that, that do good work. And they take kids, frankly, uh, that, that have gotten themselves a little bit off the paved road. And, and I go in and talk to them frequently, and we're talking. Uh, I say, you know, it's just, you, you got to steady yourselves up and, and get yourself going. But somewhere our education system needs to start harnessing those people. My, uh, my sister opened a charter school in Houston. And so her initial charter was uh, you had to be thrown in jail to get to come to my school. Uh, that was a little bit tough. Even my sister, she's, my, my sister is just, just a case all herself. So she backed it up one, and one step. And so it was just you had to be thrown out of all the other schools in Houston, and then I'll take you. Now, she wanted the worst of the worst. She was graduating a couple of years ago when I talked to her, 76 out of 78. Every year she'd bring in 78, and she could get them there. And so I said, uh, what? what does that take? And she just held up her hand and went like this. Uh, I think your moms would know what that means. Uh, she said you have to slow them down and stop them. She said sometimes I have to do that to the parents too. She said we have to get the parents in and everybody. And she said after they've been stopped and still for about six months, they start learning and uh, you can move. And she said also require that they go to work and uh, that they, they work at something. 
So those are the things. Roswell has got this program, but what does your community offer? And are you waiting on Washington, or are you all as a community saying we cannot, we can't, we can't let these kids through, fall through the cracks? We got three thousand jobs in Olive Grove, and we didn't fill them. How do we fill those jobs? How do we get the people off welfare and unemployment? Anytime you put somebody on a job, you number one, you, in, you the three six two three. You remember the equation? The two three goes up because they're going to pay some of their taxes. So two three goes up, and the three six comes down because they're no longer getting welfare, unemployment, or food stamps, or if they are, they get reduced amounts. You see how one activity, the creation of jobs or putting people into jobs, makes our deficit close together. We don't have to print the money. So my belief is that that we should create jobs. But uh, let's keep going. I'm, I'm talking way too much. I, I apologize. We just okay. Yeah, we have more questions. Hobbs, okay. We're gonna have to do this day long. Thing yes, next time. it's uh, it, WNMU. Is that Holmes? Okay. She's so Silver, 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 Silver City is the one that you couldn't hear before. Okay. Yes. okay. Let's go to Silver City. The question is: as a serial entrepreneur, and oh wait, I okay. unmuted them. <laughs> Can you hear us? Yes. So who yes. do we have pulled uh, up? Hold on. Here, yes, we can hear you. Be muted. Go ahead. I don't know if you can hear her again. I have her can question you hear right me? here. Yes. Go ahead. Wait. Okay. I'm Lynn David Smith from Silver City. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I am a member of the Local Investment Opportunity Network, which provides peer-to-peer -peer micro loans and mentoring to small businesses starting up here in Silver City. We have a big issue with infrastructure, and especially infrastructure having to do with bandwidth. I don't know if this teleconference has worked for everyone else, but we've had a lot of problems here hearing and seeing you. There are a number of folks here who have skills or are developing skills that would allow them to do teleconferencing work or teaching online or other service work where they use uh, online media. We need help in terms of getting bigger bandwidth up here. I'm sure that as a consortium of the university and the wellness center and the volunteer center and the health counselor and various other organizations, the small business development, we can work together, but we're going to need some federal help to, to get broadband up here so that we can use the skills we're developing to create more jobs. I um, want to just make a statement, which is the old economic model of let's bring in a big store or a big service center like Stream that was brought in here to Silver City, harvested money from Silver City, and then escaped after Bain Capital uh, bought a uh, holding majority is not the way for small towns like us to build jobs. If we really have to do it ourselves with small business owned, owner owned, profitably owned business structures. And we need help in broadband infrastructure. Several years ago, uh, when I was in the state legislature, I became aware that, that our entire state was hooked together. The National Guard armories were actually had a fiber optic loop that was decades ahead of, of that requirement. Um, let us take a look at, at that fiber optic loop. I don't know if it's still there. I don't know if it uh, has the capacity to, to uh, allow us to tap into it. But broadband is actually one of the, the, the greatest risks that we face uh, in New Mexico. Uh, the rest of the, the world, the rest of the nation is online and, uh, and it creates economic opportunities that, that are limited to us when we don't share that concern and uh, we'll be happy to, to work with you on it. Again, you, you heard there in Silver City, they've got that mentoring group that group that will oversee the overlook the shoulders of, of people trying to get into business to let you know how how much upward potential that New Mexico has uh, and the numbers aren't exactly right but the concept will be right when I first started in 2003 serving in Washington uh, I think it was Rice University had formed a, a group and they they were basically a safety net for businesses and Rice University then was creating a lot of, of uh, very quickly uh, starting up uh, startup businesses in in, uh, in IT field. Then we took a look from New Mexico to the Research Triangle in North Carolina, and, and I think that the world knows that, that those dollars going to that Research Triangle in, in that three-state area there had really blossomed because of that. The Research Triangle in North Carolina receives about $70 million a year uh, in New Mexico, we get about 700 million a year, and, and yet you don't see that push of jobs. 
So uh, we started trying to get this this uh, safety now. These these people would come in and help our entrepreneurs with all of the accounting, with management, with human resources, all of those things to see if we can't harvest from that. We still have not, uh, as New Mexico, have not done a great job, and that would be one of the growth potentials that, that we have. I think the spaceport is, is another area that we have tremendous growth potential, but, but we need people out there who are willing to get in and, and make that growth occur. Silver Next. City has one more comment. Okay. 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 Silver City? Oh, go ahead. <coughs> Maybe I'd rather leave the ticket. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a, a question slash comment. I'm going to go back to the building uh -oh. issue. Um, it's more state concerned. Being a, a co-owner of a construction company, it's uh, you know we everybody wants us to uh, produce a uh, affordable home, but we are so regulated here in the state as far as inspections, um, and we are lucky if we get inspections um, once once every two weeks. There's what three, maybe four inspectors. Every step has to be inspected. We also have to carry so much um, liability insurance. We have so much workers' comp, anywhere from 40 to 50 cents on the dollar. Um, then on top of that, we have to have like a builder's risk policy on what we're building. Um, by the time we pay 30 and 40 thousand dollars for a lot, we pay for all that and the construction. We cannot produce a affordable home. We are we're too regulated. We, we need we need to work on some of the regulations, loosening something up or maybe put more inspectors on or even we have two in our town um, we need to do something about that and as far as the job situation this is kind of another thing we have lots of jobs here um, there's lots of places to go to work you can go there's there's there is help one and five on every corner our problem is and i've actually been told um, in the hiring process i can make more than that at home um, I understand the, the welfare situation, but it needs to be regulated somehow. People don't want to work here because they're making more at home than they can at Chili's or a Home Depot. Okay, uh, two, two points that I think bear out. Uh, the idea of, of regulation and over-regulation has been really politicized, and, and I hear this comment. And I know there, this is tricky ground because people say, oh, you got to have regulation. I would absolutely agree. But I hear more frequently that our jobs are being tamped down, they're being uh, stifled because uh, of regulators who just don't show up or, or when they show up they don't get the work done or, or they find something. Uh, a good case was in Ruidosa about two years ago and there was, a, for Ruidosa I think it's uh, Labor Day, that is, is the big, big day in Ruidosa. You can make your year in that weekend. And so this restaurant was getting ready to open, ready to open, and so the two weeks before Labor Day, the inspector came in and said, oh shucks, I forgot to tell you, I forgot to tell you, we wanted three sinks, not two. You're going to have to tear it all out, and I'll be back in three weeks. They're going to miss now the Labor Day. So they, they had their big investment, and he forgot. And uh, so I said to the people in the town, why don't you take that in hand? I said, the, the bureaucrats feel almost like it's no big deal so make a facebook page and start advertising for this bureaucrat that's so crass that you would cause you to lose a year's worth of profits and and the ability to open a new restaurant so sometimes i think that we should be speaking back as communities and saying this is just not appropriate we, we'll live with good regulations but what you're doing is not good regulations and so i think that we we've got to make our, our agencies accountable and responsive we, we don't want unsafe things, but, but we do want jobs and we do want economic uh, potential. Uh, and then, uh, see, the, the second thing I think she talked about, somebody help me with the second main point there. Sorry, uh, you're still standing. Go ahead with the second. Oh, yeah, people are making more money. They're making more money on government assistance than what they can make here. And sometimes, well, when, any business owners in here? What are your, what are your requirements? Uh, because I think I already know, but... Um, what are your requirements to, uh, to hire somebody? What do you want? Someone knows how to work. Uh, well, we used to ask if you could pass a drug test. Now we just ask, can you get to work? <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> that's yes, that's, that's what I hear everywhere. Show up for work is the first requirement and pass a drug screen. And, and you can hear, uh, they don't even do that. They put themselves at liability. It, the threshold for working is very slow. We, we'll teach you everything else. In the oil field, to drive a truck, you need a CDL. In the oil field, they're saying, whoa, 
we need drivers so bad that we'll let you, if you don't have a CDL, we'll train you to drive, and you can drive on the dirt roads where you don't need the CDL, and we'll have a CDL driver waiting. When you get your truck full, you bring it back, we give you an empty truck, and you can drive it on the dirt roads, fill it up, and bring it back. That's what we're being driven to in the country, and so you can disagree intensely with me, but I just felt a need to address what I'm hearing here from business owners that we got to have people in the and they can't pass the drug screen, and so I put those bills in. Again, I have a lot of disagreement, a lot of agreement that says to draw these government checks that you you yes. have to be drug screened Thank first. You. I mean, to Thank do that, you. I like that. Yeah. because yes. what government would allow the future generations to just be cavitated by parents who are in drugs? Yes. I was talking last night in Silver City. We were there. A special ed mom, our special ed teacher. She's young, got her own family. She said, I, my class is full of kids whose moms have been on methamphetamines and the kids now, they're never going to be able to develop normally. Yeah. She said, what kind of a society will stand back and subsidize that? Right. And I told her about my bill and she said, well, I would be a strong supporter of that. Other people don't agree, but Lord, these are the discussions that we need. Mm -hmm. How do we, yeah. as a people, go and start curing the problems, not allowing people to sit at home? I think if you will not take work and you're on unemployment and you got a job, I just think we as a nation should ask the question, should you get unemployment? Those are the questions that we ought to be talking about right. in this virtual Congress and this, mm -hmm. this thing that we're doing. We'll get into those more at a future time. Again, we've got comments everywhere. This is, this is the reason that we wanted to do it, because we see this, this vitality come out, the discussion start really banging along. And you see also they're not very Democrat or Republican. I just I love that piece about it. That's okay, thank you. I, I, my name is Peggy Dixon, Peggy, thanks. I, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to have these discussions. Um, I'm actually going to, to mirror what the last speaker was, was um, discussing. The reg um, I, I'm a CEO of a, of a nonprofit agency here in town that provides community services, um, um, services for those with developmental disabilities and um, public transportation in town, child care, and um, early intervention services. Um, the, the regulatory environment of, of businesses in this nation, whether it be manufacturing or, or community services such as we provide, are absolutely crippling. And on top of, on top of facing unprecedented budget cuts, um, which, are, which are starting at the federal level and trickling down to the state level and trickling down to us, at the same time, our regulations are ever increasing, ever increasing, ever increasing, and it is absolutely crippling our nation as far as as far as businesses are concerned. And I would, I would like to know what can be done about this. Yes, I think, I think that what can be done is for us as people to come together and and like like Mike upon me. We would probably never agree on everything. But right now, the two sides, the two parties are this far apart nationally. Forget Washington. Washington's a reflection of the streets. And so Washington, are, we're nationally this far apart. In the regulations, I think we could squeeze in here. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, you've seen I've had a fairly significant conversation with the Forest Service on about logging and, and the spotted owl and the not logging and burning down the trees and uh, putting us at risk, uh, burning down habitat. And so uh, we went up to the Lincoln National Forest and we took a tour. Um, and, uh, and basically the groups who have been you know, pushing back against the logging are saying, uh, maybe we should be cutting bigger trees and cutting more. And, and that's, that's the sort of thing that, that would create jobs here. We used to have these two mills here in, in uh, Otero County. Um, you would create jobs in the industry up around Cloudcroft. The people in Cloudcroft say, you know, we used to make good living wages up there in the timber industry and now working in the hotels we can't feed our families so we've we've crowded out those jobs which would provide the living wage I think that our, one of our initial comments was on that and and now we have jobs that are less so we as a nation should be looking at the regulations that say uh, what about this and by the way when we went to look at the spotted owl in the Mescalero the spotted owls are actually leaving the habitat, that is the areas that they're not being logged, and they're scooting over into the areas that have been logged because they need to forage. They need, they need altitude, they need to sit in the tree and, 
get an airspeed and come down and they catch whatever they catch and go back up. And so, so they're scooting away from what we as men decided, and men as humans decided was the habitat that was perfect and moving to a different habitat where they can do better. Uh, so, so again, we should be re-looking at the regulations that are choking off our potential, but we should be doing it here. I think if we'll do it here, I'll be right well, what are we talking about? Let's yeah, okay, all right, here. Go, go, yeah. I'd be remiss if we don't take the last 15 minutes to talk about what we are going to do here in our state to change our economy. We need to come up with a solution as women to change our economy. I think we need to be prepared, uh, one, for government to stop over-regulating. We need to be prepared for them to get out of our business so that we can expand. We should be prepared for them uh, to stop printing money. And we should be prepared for them to reform welfare. And what are we going to do uh, as a community for the underemployed and for those that uh, won't accept the minimum wage? Well, I admire Corpus Christi. They uh, utilize their government, their local government, uh, with grant funding, capital improvements uh, through their state, and also uh, private industry, uh, miracle growth. They developed a city farm. And for those that could not afford the food on their table, one, because inflation, government's printing money, uh, 10 years ago, at the same wage I'm making now, I could fill my basket for 50 bucks. I have to fill my basket for almost $200 now. And so the cost of inflation uh, has hurt our bottom line as families and as business owners, and I think there's something that we need to do as women in our community, but we've got to be ready to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty. Right. And it's time that we pull together as women and come up with real solutions. And so I'd like to turn it over to women and let me know, um, Mike Canterbury, this is Okay, we have another question over here in the time we have left, so come on over, Nadia. Get over close to Mr. Pearson. I just have a couple of questions and a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for coming. I hope that I'm not um, infringing on anybody else's time, but a couple things. Uh, one of the attendees who had to leave wanted me to say, and this is Amy Rivers, wanted me to say that busing our people every two weeks sounds like indentured servitude. Uh, you can't compare this to military deployment unless you provide all the services military families receive as well. And I think that's a, a point well taken. Uh, yeah. Busing people back and forth yeah, I, may not be the solution. The other thing I want to say is just jumping on your bandwagon. If we want to do things locally, if we want to be able to help ourselves, we need to be taking advantage of some of the issues that are on our current ballot. We've got a GRT, we've got some GO bonds coming up. The GO bonds provide construction jobs at the college. I think that's important. These are bonds that can, uh, they're going to repair roofs, but they will also provide construction jobs. This is state level grassroots for Alamo Gordo. The GRT that's coming up, I've got a lot of information with it, if anybody wants some additional information, but that GRT, a lot of the organizations who spoke here today would benefit from that GRT. That's something that's local, money from Otero County, staying in Otero County. As Congressman Pierce was talking about doing things locally, state level, everybody's nodding their heads. But when it comes to voting on something that could help us, people stay away from it. And that's just my recommendation. If you're interested in working from the ground up, it starts here in our county, just like the other counties who are out there. They all have similar geo bond issues, they all have similar initiatives where they're trying to work from the grassroots level. If we want to help ourselves, now's the time to do it. Okay, good point. Okay, we have another comment over here. Any, any comments from our, we, we never got some. Yeah, and then, uh, let me get see. closer to the, Mr. Come on then. Have them queued up ready. So, uh, we have a couple of comments from Socorro. One, my husband and I own a small business. We're being so overregulated that we're being required to pay insurance now for employees. And also a comment from Squirrel, they're a small community, uh, their population is aging, so housing is becoming a problem for them. If there's no housing, it's tough to uh, be able to bring folks in to work. Absolutely, yes. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, we try to get uh, the Islata Indians come down into Lee County and, and build those $63 dollar foot houses. Uh, they decided they didn't want to work off campus, but. And, and I understand and respect that, but, but I think that there are innovative solutions out there for building. Uh, we actually had a guy in El Paso just recently grab me, and they were going to take the different uh, building technology over to Africa and build 
houses there that uh, again were, were highly insulated water wells right there with them uh, I just think that we have to challenge ourselves to, to stop waiting on someone else to fix the problems and start generating solutions. So, Mayor, I appreciate your comments. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I love that out-of-the-box thing. I think we need more of that. Yeah. Nancy Hudson with Children Need Services. Um, it's been touched on a little bit, but I think something that's missed in this conversation that we need to address. Talking about insurances, you know, we are a large nonprofit. We employ about 115 people a year. We're one of the larger employers. For that, we have to have not only obvious health insurance availability, we have to have our uh, workman's comp insurance, but in terms of something that really is amazing and hurtful to businesses, all the liability insurances. We have building liability, professional liability, directors and officers liability, and more. We need to address in New Mexico tort reform, lawsuit reform. Yeah. Texas has done it, and so guess what's happening to the attorneys in Texas? Guess what they're coming? They're coming to New Mexico because ah. of the reform. Yeah, because of the reform that's happened in Texas, they're coming this way. And if we don't get on it and do something within our state to address that, business, it's, we're, we're going to put business out, out of business. Absolutely. Do I would agree 100%. The, uh, it's not well known, but in the first two years I was in Washington, we actually passed nine different kinds of, of lawsuit abuse protection, tort reform, whatever you want to call it. And all nine of those died in the Senate. Uh, we had 51 votes, but we couldn't break the 60 vote barrier, and, and so they just died over there in, in, in the Senate. But Americans, you, you hear that our jobs, that our productivity, everything is, is being stifled because of, of the heavy weight of, of frivolous lawsuits. I think every single one of us would welcome the, the protection of, of the courts for things that are wrong. But it's the frivolous ones, the ones that are just out there kind of running a lottery uh, against business owners, against nonprofits. Those are the things that we, uh, as a nation, I think, find objectionable. We have other comments? You know, we should probably go around the, the organizations here. Carlsbad, is there anyone in Carlsbad who has a comment um, or a Actually, question? we have um, Silver City first, WNMU. Um, okay, why don't we bring up Silver City then? Okay. <laughs> They're ready. Silver City, you are on. Good. Good morning. I'm Priscilla Lucero. I'm the Executive Director of the Southwest New Mexico Council of Governments, and I represent the Southwest region. What I'd like to talk to you about today or comment on is increasing opportunities for businesses in rural, in rural areas. A lot of our issues are, are based around what opportunities do we have in these rural areas, and, and many times, uh, what happens is that we don't have access to those different funding mechanisms or programs as a result of being so rural. And sometimes it takes the business to go to the metropolitan area to get service. Although we're very fortunate that we have a small business development center that is a us for that. But in many cases, um, you know, they have a lot of areas to cover. So we need to think about how we can increase those opportunities in rural areas. In addition to that, we also need to look at more vocational education opportunities or, or, or vocational career tech centers in these rural areas so that we can increase and expand the education not only of adults but those children in the middle school and high school so that they can begin to look at what all educational opportunities or jobs they may be interested so we can foster those jobs within our community. And in addition, as the lady mentioned earlier in from Silver City, is that broadband is a huge issue in not only in this community but also in the region. And there's always going to be a need for additional infrastructure. If we don't have those basic needs met, which are providing the adequate water, wastewater, you know, uh, transportation in the roads, then we're not going to have those opportunities for economic development. So we need to continue to fund those programs such as TDPG, such as the USDA water and wastewater um, grant program, the Economic Development Administration program, so that we can continue to improve those infrastructure needs within our community. And then lastly, uh, one of the huge issues that we see in our community, as mentioned before in some of the comments, is in regards to housing. And that means housing for all individuals, from seniors, to newly wet couples that are trying to tap into funding mechanisms, mortgages. And so what ends up happening is some cases, the mortgages, um, the regulations associated with that are so difficult that we can't even get first-time home buyers to 
be able to qualify uh, nonetheless as a result of not having good credit. So we need to do something along those lines that improves the credit of those families and that also will help build the economy. But also in issues in regards to, say, for example, the Lordsburg. We have a tremendous amount of Border Patrol agents in Lordsburg and their housing. So I, I don't think it's feasible for them to have to commute an hour to two hours to get to work every three days because of the lack of housing. So those are my comments. Um, with okay, yeah. we, we appreciate that. Uh, as you can see, um, we in rural areas are, are under uh, pretty strong pressure. I would tell you that most fights in Washington are not uh, not Democrat or Republican. Most fights are large against small. And you know where large uh, large states will always outvote the smaller states. Big population centers will always uh, be able to muscle out the smaller areas. And so, so I think our founding fathers they wanted more of our these uh, initiatives inside the state. In other words, the state should be doing. The, 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 the taxing and the, the, the funding of the mechanisms because they can get a, a closer view of what's inside the state. But the chances of us getting money actually down to Lawrenceburg, for instance, from Washington, I mean, you can visualize the, the political problems of trying to do that. And, and I'm one voice against the, the 50 in California or the 30 in Texas, and, and it just all comes with political uh, strength there. So, uh, so at some point we need to address that that whole federalism issue that would be a different discussion but beyond that i was in the state legislature from 97 to 2000 and we i was on the economic development piece and we were up in taos one time and, and uh one of the the ladies there that did showed up she was just uh, i was hearing the same discussion the same frustration and, and a desire and at one point she said i think that we as americans are losing our ability to start business our entrepreneurial capabilities and that's been one of the great strengths of this country that we could start businesses just almost uh at will and and somebody could get a new idea and and that we as people are forgetting those so my wife and i back in that same period of time then we we uh, went around town in hobbs and said how what can we do and so we gathered up ten thousand dollars and then we uh, brought youth in and had a youth entrepreneurship. They could borrow real money from us that day and then create products. So it was a weekend thing. And then they paid their loans back. Uh, and so they, they really began to develop that experience and, and what to do the basics of running a business. Borrow money, sell a product, control your expenses, and pay your loans back. And, and that's something that, that maybe we as a state or, or some of these, uh, some of our smaller communities should be working on because now then, rural is not uh, no longer uh, a limiting element if we have the, the broadband that Silver City was talking about earlier. So uh, what can we do? What can we do as people here? I see everyone is uh, starting to move from some other location. I think we're probably very close to ending. We are. We have about five minutes, but we have a question from the folks in Las Cruces. A single mother works full time. Just received, received her bachelor's, so she's, tr she's trying to get her education, right. trying to improve herself. She has a chance to take a job that will give her a few more thousand a year, but as a single mother, it doesn't cover all of her family's expenses, she, but she will lose her child care assistance, and it just seems to be tough to get over that hump when you want to try to improve yourself. The, the young ladies that I was having a discussion with last night in, in Silver City were, were pointing out that same thing. And, uh, and, and somewhere we should, and I think these would be the discussion groups nationwide where we would phase out that support. Uh, and if she's making a certain amount and it's not quite to the threshold, she should be able to get something. Yes. Uh, and exactly. what we do is we penalize them 100%. So people say, I, just, I don't want to even take a job. I think a lot of Americans right. would take a job if we could phase that, that support level down. Don't take it all away. Just if you're getting this much and then you get a job for this much, then we pay the yes, incremental difference. Thank you. And so uh, I think that we could, we, we, and this is the reason, because guys, I don't think, to, I, I do this because I talk in front of women all the time, and so I, I finally get the idea. That's the reason that we wanted these groups to come together. Again, we know the things that would separate us, and we could debate those until, but I think America is tired of, of the things that separate us, and I think we're ready to go to solutions. I think we're ready for you all to get engaged in the system and say, if you don't have the ideas in Washington, then we should give them to you from here. Now keep in mind how the process is, uh, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and wrap up if we only got three or four minutes. There's only two more questions. Oh, you got two more? That's it, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me go briefly into the, 
what happens in Washington is that, that typically I would get ideas from here, and then I go back to Washington and I would give them to a staffer. And I, I make pretty good notes. I, I really pay attention. I give them to a staffer, and then they might not understand fully because I've got 65 years of experience, and they may have 25 years of experience. And they would try to put it in, they would take it into the committee, and then the committee would take those, now they're two steps removed or three steps from me, and they would try to put it in, and they would have both parties putting things in. And so it gets over here, and it doesn't even end up looking like what it is, and it doesn't really address the problems. And so we face that, and, and I think that our committee system in Washington, in, I think that law should start out here and have kind of a Wikipedia law where you can put in stuff and ideas, and everybody's looking at them, and they observe and say, no, those are not good ones, these are good ones. I think when you get enough inputs, we as Americans would come to conclusions and we would agree across party lines and we would agree to the solutions. But in Washington, it's, it's, it's such committee-driven stuff and, you know, the bills, and you write it, and you got lawyers writing the bills, and pretty soon they're trying to, anyway, the stuff gets bogged down. So let's take a couple more questions, and then I think Susie may wrap us up here. Okay. Um, I have on the line. Mine, again, is about education. Oh, can I talk? Yes, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think probably if we're looking for solution that it starts with the education system, uh, I think we need to take back our schools. We've got to have more local control of our, our, our school. Uh, the culture has really changed, and, and I teach at the junior college part time. The students are not prepared when we get here. Uh, I found a different uh, public school students uh, expect you to put all the information into them and uh, they really don't get it if they have responsibility. I find that the homeschool children that I teach are much more prepared, that they take initiative uh, and they do much better. And the problem is that we don't have level of control of the teachers are teaching for the test. Uh, uh, there's just too much going on. We need to empower our local school district and our teachers and our parents to get, get away from teaching for the test. We will have better workforce, we'll have better students. Yes. Uh, the, my point has, has been that I talk to teachers around the second district and they say the biggest problem in their classroom is discipline. 60% of the time they say that they'll spend on discipline. I don't think that we can ever fix our schools until we fix the families. Families send their kids to school without discipline, without being ready to learn, and they penalize your kids. Your kids go and they're ready to go. And somewhere we as community, from, from Washington, we can almost do nothing. We can put standards and we can put this stuff, and then pretty soon all the schools are failing, and we, so we say that we're going to take your funding away, and then we don't do that, and then we threaten something else. We just need to go into our local schools. If you have control, if we block granted money to local school districts, leave all the bureaucracies aside, let local school districts contract back with the federal government and the state government for those things that are handy and useful, but you make the decisions, I think our school boards would be a lot more effective. I think school boards feel like they have no power. They can't fight Washington. So if we return the power, shame on you if you can't teach your kids. But right now, it's like you don't have the power. You can't change anything, and so people get frustrated and get angry. Uh, so we, we need to wrap up. I'm going to turn it over to the mayor, but before that, everybody always says, you know, to, if you're going to do something, you got to do it 100% right. you got to, you, you know that, that saying in life. And I approach it differently, that everything worth doing is worth doing wrong. Because you, so we made a lot of mistakes here today. The technology, you've heard the criticism, has not been great. But I tell you that, that every step of a thousand miles begins with a loan at the bank first and then to the first step. So, uh, so, we, uh, so we're making the first step. Uh, if, uh, if it's been a good one, you all can leave comments with your, your monitors and proctors and that uh, thing. I would like to continue them uh, because I believe that, that, that you can see the seeds of what I've seen. I've, I've seen the discussions continue on. Or I've heard that the discussions continued on in the previous ones afterwards. People just buzzing with new ideas and thinking outside the box. And that's what we need. Mayor, as a thinker outside the box, I congratulate you. Uh, I mean, I'm Thank doing you the thinker outside the box. Appreciate what you're doing and appreciate uh, you coming in and putting yourself right in the middle of the fire here in all the world. Well, thank you for supporting us all locally uh, in, our, in our federal government. Thank you for fighting that fight for us. Okay. And uh, for those uh, of you here that didn't have an opportunity to present your comments or your questions, please write it down on a note card 
uh, with your name, address, phone number, email, and Congressman Pierce will answer you. Uh, I think we're on the uh, beginning of genius. I think that we will find a solution. There are answers, and I think we need to meet together often. Uh, women are the solution to the problem. It starts in the home, and I think we can fix it in our home. As mayor, I'd love to uh, find a solution. How can I go out to these women who do not feel capable of going outside their home to find a job? I want to reach out to them and say, let me help you get a job. Let me help you get off of the welfare system. And I think it's brilliant uh, to have a subsidy uh, to reduce the amount of welfare that one receives to help them find a job. And so I thank all the women who have joined us here in Alamogordo and by teleconference and other locations. And uh, thank, you thank you very much. Thank all you. Right, thank you. 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 Thank